Friday, April 13th, 1945. America is in shock. The Second World War is not yet over, and U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt has just died. Roosevelt was a great craftsman of peace. More than anyone else, he embodied the hope of seeing the world rebuilt on a better basis. As the silent crowd watches the funeral procession go past, the whole planet is asking itself, without Roosevelt, will the Soviet bloc in the West manage to build bridges and build a lasting peace? April 12, 1945, the White House in Washington. Three hours after Roosevelt's death, Harry Truman becomes the new president of the United States. He makes his first appearance in a world riven by chaos. In April 1945, America is still at war with Hitler and the Japanese. To add to the complications, Truman has been vice president for just three months. And he never seemed to be predestined to be the new president of the USA. He's a former shirt and tie salesman from Missouri. He went into politics late in life and was elected to the Senate for the first time 10 years ago. When Roosevelt selected him as his vice president, it wasn't for his abilities. He considered him clueless. He chose him purely for electoral reasons. It's very common in the US. Vice presidents are not necessarily selected for their intelligence. It's often because they can win votes from important areas. Overnight, the former shopkeeper from Missouri has been propelled to the head of the world's biggest superpower. He himself is flabbergasted and doesn't try to hide it. The front pages scream out what Truman has told journalists. Boys, if you ever pray, pray for me now. I don't know whether you've ever had a load of hay fall on you, but when they told me what happened, I felt like the moon, stars, and all the planets had fallen on me. Even today, President Truman's grandson remembers that his grandfather never tried to pretend that he was the man for the job. He was not ready for that at all. He actually said, there must be a million people, a million men better qualified to do this job than I am, but it's mine to do, so I'm gonna do it. He was the kind of man who, when given a job, did it. The task promises to be Herculean. He will have to build the world of tomorrow on solid bases, but Truman has no experience of international politics. In the three months he has been vice president, Roosevelt has only met him in private twice. Truman has been told nothing. I fault my grandfather for not trying to bring him more into the picture. I wonder how much energy my grandfather had. I think he was well aware of his diminishing energy. And to bring Truman into the picture may have been more than he could face. Two months before his death, Roosevelt had met with Stalin and Churchill at Yalta. It was there, in Crimea, that the Big Three had laid the foundations for future peace. But the deals concluded were complex and full of ambiguity, each of the Allies having played his own hand. Truman 
was not privy to these discussions. He needs to familiarize himself with all the dossiers. He is pragmatic and hardworking, so he has countless briefings with his advisors. But will his relentless work be enough? Can this small-time Thai salesman from Missouri hold his own against the formidable Stalin? One month after Truman accedes to the White House, the Allies win the war in Europe. All over the continent, people are jubilant. Outside Buckingham Palace in London, a human tide greets Winston Churchill. The British Prime Minister is lauded as a hero. But even at this euphoric moment, Churchill looks drawn. The smile on his face looks a little forced. In his memoirs, he writes, Weary and worn, impoverished, but undaunted and now triumphant, we shared a moment that was sublime. Yet it may well be there were few whose hearts were more heavily burdened with anxiety than mine. What could seem so terrible that it could darken such a moment? The problem Churchill has goes by the name of Stalin. Now the war in Europe is won. The British Prime Minister is convinced that Stalin will seize this opportunity to install communist regimes everywhere he can. Already, contrary to the pledges made at Yalta, the Soviet leader has established a communist regime in Romania. In Poland, six non-communist ministers have been allowed to join the government, but they have a little less power every day. Stalin wanted all of Europe to become communist. It was an ideology. But also because he had the mindset of an emperor. A dictator with an emperor's mindset. The British Prime Minister tries to warn Truman. But the new American president is not interested. For now, Truman has taken the tack that he will honor the agreements made by Roosevelt. He will not have a word said against his communist ally. Churchill can only wait and hope that Truman will see the Soviet leader's true colors for himself. The opportunity soon arises. July 16th, 1945, Berlin Airport. The US president's plane has just landed. Truman is in Europe for a peace conference. This is his opportunity to meet his allies and make up his own mind about them. Talks are to take place at Potsdam, a few miles from Berlin. In order to get there, Truman has to go through the former capital of the Third Reich. Berlin is nothing more than a land of ruins. A few bone-weary people wander around aimlessly. The scene of desolation upsets Truman, and convinces him that he needs to help Germany get back on its feet. That evening, he writes in his diary, Never have I seen such a sorrowful and depressing sight. We saw old men, old women and young women, carrying what they could of what they had left, to nowhere in particular. The conference begins on the next day, July 17th. Here at Sicilianhof Castle, Truman, Stalin, and Churchill meet for the first and only time. As Truman expected, Churchill seems charming. 
but his advisors keep telling him that Stalin is not to be trusted. However, the new president quickly sizes up the man with whom he'll have to negotiate. I can deal with Stalin. He is honest, but cunning as hell. Stalin, on the other hand, has no concerns about Truman, whom he just sees as a small-time shopkeeper from Missouri. Stalin knows very little about Truman because he was a bit part player. His spies hadn't really spoken about him and what they had said led him to believe that he was insignificant and weak and could be made to agree to anything. But Truman is a man who sticks to his guns. For against all expectations, despite his lack of experience, the American president knows how to stand firm. He's in no way cowed by Stalin. A matter of character, certainly, but not only that. Truman feels he's in a strong position because he's waiting for a piece of information that could make him the most powerful man on the planet. At that precise moment in the United States, a top secret event is being prepared. While he's negotiating, the president is keenly anticipating some news. On day two of the negotiations, he finally receives a telegram in coded language. Doctor has just returned most enthusiastically and confident that the little boy is as husky as his big brother. The light in his eyes is discernible from here to high hold, and I could have heard his screams from here to my farm. The little boy in question is the first atomic bomb. For the last four years, the planet's finest scientists have been working in the greatest secrecy to develop what could be the ultimate weapon. The operation is codenamed Trinity. The first nuclear test in history is an unqualified success. The explosion is the equivalent of detonating 21 kilotons of TNT. Never before has such destructive power been achieved. A single weapon now has the power to annihilate all of humanity. After hesitating briefly, Truman decides to forewarn Stalin. This is obviously seen as bad news. It means that henceforth the Soviet Union is in a position of inferiority. Everyone was watching out for Stalin's reaction. And Stalin, who was a good actor, said, Ah, oh, well, I'm pleased for you, and I hope you'll use it against Japan. But was Stalin really in the dark? Despite the drastic measures taken by the Americans to protect the secrecy of their project, Russian spies have managed to infiltrate the Los Alamos base where the atomic bomb was being developed. Among them is Klaus Fuchs, a German physicist who has fled the Nazis. But Fuchs, a fervent communist, is also a spy in the pay of the Soviet Union. For the last few years, the scientist has been passing on all of the plans for the atomic bomb to the Russians. Thanks to this information, the Soviet Union has begun to develop its own nuclear bomb. Despite this, on July 24th, when Stalin finds out that the American bomb is ready, he becomes anxious. There is nothing Stalin hates more than feeling vulnerable. He called together his entire Potsdam entourage and he asked them to tell the scientists and everyone else working on the atomic project that he wanted them all to speed up the creation of the Russian atomic bomb as much as possible. The bomb would become an obsession for Stalin. Until he has his own atomic bomb, the supreme leader will not feel confident facing the Americans. His relationship with Truman is about to become fraught. 
Potsdam will also be the backdrop for another conflagration. In mid-conference, Churchill leaves the negotiating table to head for London to receive the result of the general election. A passionate Democrat, the British Prime Minister has thrown his hat in the ring once again. He's acclaimed throughout Britain in the weeks he spends campaigning. But as the day dawns on the morning of the election, he has a feeling of foreboding. I woke suddenly with a sharp stab of almost physical pain. The power to shape the future would be denied me. Churchill's intuition is correct. And to general amazement, he loses the election. Rather than their war hero, the British people have opted for a new man, the Labour leader, Clement Attlee. The day after his triumph, Attlee settles into Churchill's still warm seat. Around the table, there is a general sense that there's been a casting error. Clement Attlee is a man who seems truly insignificant. Churchill used to say he was a sheep in sheep's clothing, or an empty car stops outside Downing Street and Attlee gets out of it. A modest man with much to be modest about. And this leaves Stalin puzzled, because he was convinced that Churchill had all he needed to be able to rig the election, which in Stalin's eyes is what any politician worth his salt would do. Faced with a lost and awkward Attlee, Stalin takes matters into his own hands. He's the last man standing of Yalta's big three. Under Attlee, Great Britain is now on the sidelines. There are only two superpowers left in the world, the USA and the USSR. Truman and Stalin meet face to face. Very quickly, the differences between the two men turn sour and become genuinely contentious. Five days after Potsdam, Truman makes a decision which will have significant consequences. The USA will use its atomic bomb against Japan. This ratchets up the tension with Stalin. August 6, 1945. In the early hours of the morning, the American bomber Enola Gay flies towards the Japanese archipelago. At 8.15, Little Boy is dropped on Hiroshima. A huge mushroom cloud billows over the city. The temperature on the ground reaches 4,000 degrees. 70,000 people die instantly. The city is nothing more than a wasteland of ash and dust. Three days later, on August 9th, it's Nagasaki's turn to be bombed. The whole world is in shock. Stalin sees the atomic bomb as provocation. He's convinced that Truman is trying to intimidate him. He doesn't understand why America has launched its bombs when, on the 8th of August, as promised, the USSR joined the war against Japan alongside the USA. The way we saw it was that the U.S. was sending a clear message in using the atomic bomb against Japan. The aim was not to achieve a quick victory against the Japanese, but to intimidate the Soviet Union in order to be able to dictate American conditions. Obviously, Truman wanted to end the war as quickly as possible and save American lives. But it is also a clear message to Stalin because Truman fully intends to let him know that he is now in the driver's seat.
From then on, Stalin wants to know how much leeway he will get with Truman and decides to test him. At Yalta, Stalin was promised territory in exchange for joining the war against Japan. Sakhalin Island, the Kurin Islands, Dairen, Port Arthur, and a Manchurian railway line. But now, Stalin demands to be allowed to occupy Hokkaido Island. In a telegram to Truman, Stalin explains... Russian public opinion would like to see our troops get an occupation zone in part of the archipelago. Anything to the contrary would be seriously offensive. I hope my modest request will be satisfied. He then rethinks and adds in his own hand. We'll meet with no objection. The American president is outraged. His response is unequivocal. No. Period. Grandpa expected people to be straightforward and honest. He does the kind of people he, that's how he was. He expected people to be truthful with him and to be upfront. And when he discovered that they weren't, and he discovered that Stalin wasn't, he very quickly got his back up and, and began to deal with Stalin more, more roughly, more directly, and more confrontationally. Stalin has also decided to move things forward and press his advantage in Europe. Rigged elections, coups. Wherever he can, Stalin establishes communist regimes. Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary and Bulgaria in turn all fall into Soviet hands. The rampant Stalinization of Europe worries Truman, but he's still unsure how to approach the situation. The telegram which lands on his desk on February 22, 1946, changes everything. Its author is George Kennan an ordinary diplomat posted in Moscow. Kennan has had time to observe how Stalin operates. He has seen that Stalin wants to take control of Eastern Europe and is convinced that the only way to stop him is to stand firm. In a long telegram to Washington, he describes the Soviet apparatus. At the bottom of Kremlin's neurotic view of world affairs is a traditional and instinctive Russian sense of insecurity. Russians are impervious to the logic of reason and very sensitive to the logic of force. Kennan explains that it's pointless to try and appease Stalin. In any case, he cannot and will not be appeased because that allows him to justify dictatorship. But on the other hand, we should be firm with Stalin because he understands how the balance of power works and that when the West stands firm, he's ready to back down. Kennan's analysis confirms everything that the US president had intuitively foreseen. His change of tack is then drastic. Truman jettisons Roosevelt's former advisors, whom he considers too lenient with regards to the Soviet Union, and appoints some new men. Kennan is soon called to the White House as a special advisor. Truman is still left with a problem, that of explaining this turnaround to the American public. This will be a delicate operation, as in the eyes of America, Stalin is a great ally, the man who helped win the war against Hitler. The press has consistently hailed him as a hero. They've been exposed to four years of war propaganda, which has shown Stalin as a friend to all children and the great ally who will help America win the war. The propaganda was successful, and Stalin is very popular in the USA. The American president then has an idea. He will make use of the former British prime minister and let him deliver the bad news. Churchill still has considerable prestige, and no one will dare to doubt his word. Also, he would surely be delighted to pay a visit to the States. Since losing the election, he's been in a period of deep depression.
On March 5, 1946, everyone in the small town of Fulton, Missouri, has hung out their flag to welcome the former British leader. It's a beautiful sunny day. Truman welcomes Churchill to his home territory, wreathed in smiles. Truman is quite aware that Churchill is about to drop a bombshell, but does not let on that he knows anything. A few minutes later at Fulton University, Churchill gives a speech that will stun his audience and dismay the whole world. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind the Iron Curtain speech provokes an outcry. The Americans are shocked. Good old Uncle Joe? This strategy of Truman's is very clever in that he lets Churchill make the speech where he mentioned the Iron Curtain because it shows America and the rest of the world that this change in America's policy is not just down to Truman or a few isolated advisors, but that as significant a figure as Churchill was thinking the same way as the American president. Soon, Stalin's former admirers in the US start to consider him a dangerous tyrant. In the Soviet Union, the Fulton speech is seen as a stab in the back. Stalin is said to be furious. Intellectuals and those close to the Kremlin stand united against Churchill. Churchill, on, uh... Churchill was our country's sworn enemy. He was the leader of the world's most anti-Soviet nation in the West. He spent his whole life trying to put one over on the Soviet Union. Henceforth, European countries will have to nail their colors to either the communist or the capitalist mast. In this race to divide up the world, Stalin has a head start. He's already got his hands on countries in Eastern Europe and is making ground in the West. Communist ministers have already found their way into the French and Italian parliaments. How far will Stalin manage to extend his sphere of influence? This question haunts Truman. He understands full well that in this arm wrestle with Stalin, one thing adds weight to his opponent, poverty. Almost two years after the end of World War II, Europe has still not got back on its feet. The old continent is staring into the abyss. Truman is perfectly aware that this deprivation makes a perfect breeding ground for communism. But before he can act, he needs a clear view of the situation. In early 1947, Truman sends Montana Senator Mike Mansfield to Europe with a brief to evaluate the situation. His report is horrifying. In every country visited, there was evidence of malnutrition, tuberculosis, and disease. The greater part of the Italian population is subsisting on a bread ration from 75 to 125 grams a day. Very little in addition is eaten. When he reads the report, a new conviction awakens in Truman. If he does not come to Europe's help, he will leave Stalin a free reign on the continent. Truman then decides on a rescue plan for Europe and entrusts it to Secretary of State General George Marshall. Raw materials, machine tools, tons of equipment make their way across the Atlantic. But behind this facade of generosity, the Marshall Plan is also vital as a tool to relaunch the U.S. economy. It was also a way to bring a new vigor to American trade. Because you can't be rich on your own in the world, you need rich partners too. So by extension, if the USA, who had profited from the war, could not trade with other countries because those countries couldn't afford to buy anything, then America's wealth would go into decline. 
The Marshall Plan is also a political stratagem designed to destabilize Stalin. Because American aid is on offer to all European countries, including those in the East. And, of course, the Eastern nations, who are under the protection of the Soviet Union, are also in great need, like Poland and Czechoslovakia, who are both offered the Marshall Plan. But, ultimately, the conflict of ideologies wins the day. The Marshall Plan was perceived as an American imperialistic ploy to subjugate Western Europe. This was completely unacceptable to Stalin. Those Eastern European countries tempted by the idea of American aid were soon brought into line. In total, 16 countries, all Western, take part in the Marshall Plan. France, the United Kingdom and Italy are the greatest beneficiaries. By mid-1947, Churchill's Iron Curtain has become a reality. One city will bear the brunt of this new battle of wills between the West and the Soviet Union, Berlin. The German capital lies at the very heart of the Russian zone of occupation. But the city itself is occupied by four allied powers, the USA, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Between them, they have the task of putting Germany back on its feet, but the Allies are unable to agree on a course of action. The Soviet priority is to get their war reparations. The USSR is broke. As predicted by the peace agreements, the Russians take their compensation in kind and dismantle Germany's industry. Entire factories are dismantled and taken to the Soviet Union to be reassembled. Meanwhile, the Americans rebuild. As promised in the terms of the Marshall Plan, the Americans gave Germany $16 billion. We, on the other hand, gave nothing. But we were in no position to give anything. We had nothing. We couldn't compete. In the West, life gradually goes back to normal, while Berlin's eastern sector goes to rack and ruin. The Americans want to go further and introduce sweeping reforms to help revitalize the German economy. But Stalin objects. He wants to maintain the status quo. What Stalin wants is a comparable level of suffering on both sides of Berlin. And that the isolated inhabitants of West Berlin end up falling under the influence of East Germany. This capitalist enclave in the middle of a communist sea is unbearable. In order to get through this impasse, the Western powers see only one solution to merge their occupation zones. This will, without a doubt, infuriate Stalin. But to what extent? Could Stalin start a war? Before proceeding, the West needs information. And there's only one way to get it. Espionage. Unfortunately, in these early days of the Cold War, the American secret services are to all intents and purposes non-existent. Actually, it's worth noting that during World War II, in 1942, the Roosevelt administration created the OSS Information Service, but it was no longer active after the war ended in 1945. So, between 1945 and 47, the United States had no intelligence services as such. Therefore, in the summer of 1947, Truman decides to found a new intelligence agency, which will soon be known the world over, the CIA. Former Admiral Henry Hillenketter is named as its head. He has the difficult task of recruiting and training spies in a very short space of time. The problem is that he will need to find Russian-speaking spies. And other than the Russians themselves, not many people speak Russian. 
For this former British Secret Service operative, this was a major hindrance. The problem was how far could you trust someone who was Russian-born with uh, uh, big secrets? Because you could never guarantee that they weren't actually in, in, on the other side working for the Russians. Helen Catter wastes no time. Pragmatically, he realizes that it is among recent enemies that he will find his spies. Reinhard Galen, a former Nazi and the Wehrmacht's head of intelligence in the East, is recycled by the CIA. Galen knows the communist world extremely well. He becomes the brains behind American espionage in Germany. He helps recruit hundreds of former Nazis to the CIA. The Americans have no qualms about this. The only thing that matters to Truman is blocking Stalin's way. The logistics have changed. In the Cold War, the enemy wasn't Germany, but the Soviet Union. So, ultimately, why not make use of people who are fervently anti-communist? And obviously, those former Nazis hated communists with a passion. So why not? At this point, we're in the middle of genuine real politic. The CIA's opponents, Russia's GRU and KGB, are also very active. But they have a considerable head start, as their intelligence services have existed since the First World War. Berlin will become the world's espionage capital. In the street, the civil service, in the armed forces, there are spies everywhere. All of them, regardless of which side they're on, have the same objective. To decipher their opponent's plans and to get one step ahead of them. Espionage uh, was almost certainly a new style of warfare uh, because uh, you needed no guns uh, and it penetrated right into the center of the other side's worldview. As Truman has requested, Galen and his men try to discover what Stalin's reaction would be if the West merged its various zones in Berlin. In the late spring of 1948, the German spies think they may finally have the answer. On June 9th, a telegram from Helen Ketter warns Truman. According to the head of the CIA, if the West were to bring all of their zones of occupation together as one, Stalin's reaction would be... The USSR may be expected to continue its hindrance of Western powers in Berlin and elsewhere in Germany by any means short of military force. This is the green light the Allies were waiting for. Four days after Helen Ketter's telegram, the Americans, British and French create a new currency for their zone, the Deutschmark. Stalin sees this currency as a symbol of capitalism and a provocation. He has to react. As the German spies had predicted, the Soviet leader then decides on economic retaliation. On June 24, 1948, he cuts off all supply routes to West Berlin. The roads which link West Germany to West Berlin are blocked. 2.5 million inhabitants of Berlin are trapped. Without supplies, they will be unable to survive for long. In Washington, some of Truman's advisors urge him to respond with force. But the U.S. president decides on another option, to replenish the city's provisions from the air. He didn't want open warfare between the U.S. and the Soviets. He, that was the last thing he wanted. But he also didn't want to appear weak, like we were going to do nothing. Because if you let the Soviets get away with closing off Berlin, then they take, an, they take something else. And I, I don't think that the idea for the airlift was his, but he agreed to it because it made sense.
Four days after the blockade starts, huge British and American cargo planes fly over Berlin. Within their bellies, tons of food and goods and the famous care packages. Assembled by the American NGO CARE, these parcels contain everything the Berliners need to survive. Bacon, margarine, powdered eggs, chocolate. The taste of America. What Stalin hadn't accounted for at all was that the Americans, the English and the French together had the wherewithal to keep West Berlin supplied for 11 months to the tune of 6,000 tons a day. Every day, a cargo plane would land on one of Berlin's three aerodromes every 30 seconds. For a year, Berlin citizens live their lives to the rhythm of the aircraft flying back and forth over their heads. But despite American aid, daily life remains difficult. In order to survive, everyone does whatever they can. Sowers start appearing in the heart of the city. Soon, vegetables start growing through the tarmac. They also show themselves resourceful where heating is concerned. The Americans are not sending enough coal, so Berliners find wood wherever it is available. Trees are uprooted. Not one bench in the city has any slats left. At the markets, people trade with anything they have, coats, bags, shoes. Berliners want for everything, but they survive. The Americans, too, are determined to stand fast, whatever the cost. And as predicted by Galen, Stalin does not give the order to shoot down the American planes. He was unprepared to go to war because the Americans had the atomic bomb. The Soviet Union would not have been able to endure another war when 20 million Russians died during World War II. Realizing that he had lost the political arm wrestle, Stalin lifts the blockade on May 12, 1949. All over West Berlin, people rejoice. For the communist leader, this is a humiliating defeat. This small-time shopkeeper from Missouri has got the upper hand over the most feared man on the planet. In his memoirs, Truman can barely hide his delight. He knows that he has scored a crucial point in his battle against Stalin. The blockade had sharply turned them against communism. Germany, which had been waiting passively to see where it should cast its lot for the future, was veering towards the cause of the Western nations. This was the exact opposite of what Stalin wanted, which was to sow discord between the Allies. It actually sealed reconciliation and friendship between the German and American people. They formed a close bond and were responsible for ensuring the survival of West Berlin. Fifteen days after the blockade is lifted, the Western powers create the Federal Republic of Germany. The Soviet Union responds by founding the Democratic Republic of Germany. The Allies of yesteryear are now officially enemies. At the White House, Cannon is terrified. He is farsighted and writes... All in all, our policy on the continent takes us along a street to which there are only three outlets. A Russian collapse, a disintegration of our own position, or a terrible war. The threat of a terrible war hangs a little more heavily on the world every day. Stalin has still not recovered from the blockade debacle and wants to regain the upper hand. His efforts eventually allow him to turn the tables once more. To the horror of the Western powers on August 29, 1949, the Russians detonate an atomic bomb in Kazakhstan. 
The information provided by Fuchs and his comrades who infiltrated Los Alamos has finally borne fruit. The Soviet intelligence services helped us to accelerate the creation of a Soviet atomic bomb. And they allowed us to save a lot of resources. Our scientists believe that the information provided by our intelligence services enabled us to reduce the development time for the bomb from 10 to 5 years. This comes as a great shock to Truman. He could never have imagined that the Soviets, crippled by war, could develop a nuclear weapon so quickly. Stalin feels empowered again. The Soviet Union is once more the equal of the United States. The world teeters on the brink of terror. Raymond Aron summed up this Cold War perfectly when he said, war is impossible. Impossible because it would be nuclear. Peace is improbable. War is impossible. Peace is improbable. Conflicts are not long in breaking out. But they will remain localized and be fought by proxy. Because neither American nor Soviet blood should ever be spilt as that would cause widespread chaos. The first of these post-World War II conflicts to erupt is in a small country that few Russians or Americans would be able to identify on a map of the world. Korea. Since 1945, Korea, which formerly belonged to Japan, has been occupied on both sides of the 38th parallel. To the south by the Americans, to the north by the Soviets. Since then, North Korea's communist leader Kim Il-sung has sought to reunite his country. He has on several occasions asked Stalin for help, but the Soviet leader has always refused. However, on January 12th, the Supreme Leader changes his mind. And it is all because of a tiny little sentence uttered by Dean Acheson, the American Secretary of State. That day, in his speech on America's military ambitions, Acheson writes, This defensive perimeter runs along the Aleutians, then to Japan, then to the Ryukyus and the Philippines. He forgot about Korea. The worst mistake he could have made. There was Taiwan, Japan, the Philippines, everything you like, except Korea. It wasn't clever. Which is surprising for someone as experienced as Acheson. But he made a big blunder. Stalin took this as an encouraging sign that the Americans had softened again. Stalin then gives Kim Il-sung a green light to spring into action. At 4 a.m. on June 25, 1950, North Korean forces cross the 38th parallel. The news is immediately broken to Truman, who is spending the weekend in his home in Missouri. The American president does not hesitate for a moment. Force must be met with force. His memoirs recall. If this was to go unchallenged, it would mean a third world war, just as similar incidents had brought about the second world war. The Americans were not prepared for an attack on Korea, and they have virtually no troops there. The North Koreans make ground with alarming ease and seize Seoul in less than a week. Truman is deeply concerned. How will it all end? He writes to his wife. I hope we can contain it and not have to order our terrible weapon turned loose. Truman will not need to use the atomic bomb as he has another secret weapon in the form of a man, General MacArthur. The great hero of the war in the Pacific is in charge of the occupation of Japan. He knows Asia very well and is a peerless tactician. In just a few months, he succeeds in regaining the advantage over the communists. 
By November 1950, the Americans have invaded almost all of North Korea and are close to the Chinese border. The Cold War is suddenly looking likely to become very hot because neighboring China became communist in 1949. Mao sends 500,000 Chinese volunteers to help his North Korean brethren. Here again, you see the prudence of Mao in this conflict, in that he doesn't want China to be seen intervening as a state. So he uses this stratagem of Chinese volunteers to intervene surreptitiously. There is certainly an empirical rather than theoretical mastery of the Cold War. Everyone makes their move, but does so in a controlled way to ensure that the Cold War doesn't become a general, global and nuclear war. For Truman, these months of intense tension are psychologically exhausting. In his journal, he writes, It is hell to be the president of the most powerful nation on earth. I would rather be the leader of my village. The American president only ever refers to the White House as the White Prison. The Korean conflict is becoming a war of attrition. But it is a completely unexpected event which brings the war to an end. Stalin disappears. March 1st, 1953. Kunsevo Dacha, near Moscow. This is where Stalin now lives as a recluse. The man who struck fear in the hearts of the world has locked himself away in a cage of delusional paranoia. He fears he's going to be assassinated. When Stalin goes to bed that night, he's had a lot to drink. During the night, he suffers a cerebral hemorrhage. For 10 hours, as he lies dying, no one dares to open his door. Everyone is too afraid of the possible reprisals. He died alone, and all those who could have helped him, such as his doctor, well, he was in prison. He could have made a recovery. But when his cronies arrived, like Khrushchev, Beria, Malenkov, they didn't do anything in case it's held against them. So doctors were called, but those doctors were scared. They didn't even dare make a diagnosis because the KGB behind them is saying, be careful what you write and what you discover, comrade. After four days of death throes and no adequate treatment, Joseph Stalin dies on March 5th, 1953. As soon as the news is out, five million people flood towards Moscow. They all want to see the remains of the man who, over a quarter of a century, decided whether they lived or died. Many people who hated Stalin said, thank God he snuffed it at last. Many others saw him as a kind of demigod and were stunned to find out that he turned out to be mortal. But the third and the most important concern for everyone was, what happens now? is reeling from the shock. While Molotov and others close to Stalin carry the coffin, each of them is thinking about the future. In Moscow, just as in London and Washington, people hope that the end of the Soviet dictator will also mean an end to political tensions. Their hopes will soon be dashed. Eight years of continual latent conflict between the USA and the Soviet Union have shaped the world in such a way that there is no easy way to turn back. 
Stalin and Truman's Cold War will dominate the world and chill the hearts of humanity for nearly 40 years.